Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to a very special historic celebration. Yes, the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Right Association is deviating a little bit from its normal after dinner program, and we are going to provide you with a lighthearted evening. The event tonight is and could be called Happy Hour Conversations because it not only is a celebration of Rochambeau's birthday, but it's also five o'clock here in America and the larger part of our audience, which includes the 13 original colonies and states, uh, make up that happy hour time. And we also are at a time convenient to the Rochambeau family, friends, and international audience which is able to join us on this special festive occasion. Likely, everyone in this international audience will join me and say it's a pleasure and an honor to celebrate and pay tribute to a hero in France and a hero in America, General Rochambeau. I am Larry Abel, National Chairman for W3R, and I'm joined tonight by Colonel James Johnson, retired military, who's a regular on this program and needs no introduction. Before we get started, just a couple of things to make you enjoy the evening more. We have a chat box and the chat box will be open the entire evening. We invite you to participate and enjoy and ask questions and become a participant in the program. And we also would suggest to you that you fill your glass with the beverage of your choice because there will be a toast or two uh, that will help to make your evening more enjoyable. So let the celebration begin. Colonel Johnson, it's yours. Thank you very much, Larry. Welcome everybody, bonjour, bonsoir. We're here to celebrate a very important personage. It's, as we approach our Independence Day, it's fitting and proper that we, we remember this Frenchman who helped us make our independence possible, General Jean Baptiste d'Antien de Vimeur, Comte de Rochambeau. Today would have been his 296th birthday. So we're together this evening, this afternoon, the, tonight, depending on where you are, to salute his contributions to the United States of America. I'm honored to welcome a special guest tonight, a descendant of the Comte de Rochambeau, Madame de Goubeville. She's joining us from the Chateau de Rochambeau in the Loire Valley of France. Welcome. Thank you. Hello from France. So if you'll put up the next slide, please, Mike. The Franco-American journey was over 600 miles. It was an amazing feat of endurance and military achievement as the armies of France and America made the march from Providence, Rhode Island, and then from New York all the way down to Yorktown, Virginia. There were British armies potentially within striking range along the way. Elements of the French army marched and then sailed to their destiny at Yorktown from June until September 1781, just to remind you what year we're talking about. The Continental Army also made the march and then voyaged from Phillipsburg, New York to the York River in Virginia. It was at Phillipsburg in New York on August the 14th that Generals Washington and Rochambeau learned that the fleet of Admiral Francois Joseph Paul Comte de Grasse was sailing to the Chesapeake Bay. So there's the quick uh, thumbnail sketch, some background about the command of General Rochambeau. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists, Madame de Goubeville, daughter of Michel de Rochambeau, descendant of Jean Baptiste de Rochambeau, who lives on the family property in Wa Isher region and is the president of the association Friends of Rochambeau. You will hear from her shortly. Our second special guest is Chef Walter Stabe. He's a third generation restaurateur with over four decades of culinary experience, including 27 years at the City Tavern, Philadelphia. I would like to point out that 
27 years ago on this date, 1994, 1st of July, Chef Stay served his very first meal at the City Tavern. So this is a doubly important occasion as we remember your great cuisine at the City Tavern. Thank you. Tonight, tonight, I invite you to check out and purchase his most recent cookbook, City Tavern, Recipes from the Birthplace of America. You can buy it on Amazon Smile, and you will be able to then support our efforts at W3R. He hosts also, you can see that beside his book, he hosts the Emmy Award-winning show, A Taste of History, in which he shares 18th century cuisine. We'll get some of his insights tonight. Monsieur Johnny Carwan serves as the trail administrator for the National Park Service, Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route, National Historic Trail, Laro, and he will help us with a toast tonight. And Madame Yancey, Madame Yancey, a founding member of W3R US and the first chair of the W3R Virginia chapter Nicole served as the Honorary Consul of France in Virginia for 25 years. Her crowning achievement was the creation of the French Memorial in Yorktown, and she will give you some of her uh, reflections on that. Finally, Dr. Robert Selig is the specialist on the role of French forces on the Comte de Rochambeau during the American Revolutionary War and serves as project historian to the National Park Service for the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historic Trail Project. I'll mention that on our website, W3RUS, that you can see the many studies that Dr. Selig has done for the various states along the route. So let us begin our conversation. We'll look forward to some questions in the chat as we move along. Please feel free if you're uh, stimulated by something that you hear to put it in the chat and we'll see if we can talk about it. Madame de Goubeville, thank you so much for joining us this evening especially at the lateness of the hour in France. And I know you've had a busy day as you're opening your estate to visitors. We welcome a few words of perspective on your ancestor, if you would, please, ma'am. Thank you. On behalf of my family, I thank you very much for honoring my ancestor on his birth date. We are celebrating an outstanding officer and leader serving his king with loyalty and a devoted and caring family man. I recall that during one of our visits to the United States, my husband and myself were guests of Chef's Tape at his restaurant in Philadelphia. It reminds one of the most impressive reviews paid to the Comte de Rochambeau for leading with expertise and civility the expedition particulière, which played a crucial role in America winning its independence. We will remember him again on October the 18th when we unveil his statue on Yorktown River Walk, another compelling testimonial of his qualities which endeared him to all we met. Beautiful. Yep. Can't hear anything. I hear nothing. Just okay. Can't hear anything. There is no sound. Jim needs to unmute himself. Thank you very much, Dr. Seeley. <laughs> Johnny, if you would join us or in leading a toast. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, in honor of uh, General Rochambeau and on behalf of the National Park Service, General Rochambeau, here's to you and to our Franco-American relationship. If it were not for you, we would be drinking warm beer and eating fish and chips right now. Let us drink in a toast and give thanks in celebration of this distinguished man and the many blessings we have received for his service and for the service of the many men and women who have sacrificed and given their lives for the cause of freedom. Happy birthday, General. Huzzah. Thank you. Huzzah. Huzzah. I should have a... Huzzah. So 
to the Comte de Rochambeau, three cheers on his birthday, 296. Hip, hip, huzzah. huzzah. Hip, hip, huzzah. huzzah. Hip, hip, huzzah. huzzah. So, Nicole, it looks to me like you need to help us understand who the Comte de Rochambeau was and why we're honoring him this evening. Well, uh, in his farewell letter to Rochambeau, Washington wrote of the happiness I have enjoyed in our private friendship, the remembrance of which will be pleasing circumstances in my life. So who was Rochambeau we are celebrating on this day? He was a French nobleman and a career military officer who had a great impact on the American War of Independence. He was born in Vendôme in the heart of France on July 1st, 1725 to a family of landowners proud of their heritage and with a long military tradition. As a young man, he was intended for the church and he studied in a seminary. He was sent to the army following the death of his older brother and starting at age 16, he fought in many battles with skill and with bravery. His advancements in the army rank recognized his brilliant leadership of troop, which also earned him eminent honors. Upon being promoted to major general, he received the powerful post of Inspector General of the Infantry in 1761. He worked on improving the training of troops and banning the, conception, the consumption of alcohol before battle. It is said that he was simple in his state, but dignified in his behavior. Happily married to Jeanne Therese Thélès d'Acosta, he spent as much time as he could in their estate near Vendôme distancing himself from court intrigue and plots. It is therefore not surprising that Rochambeau, then promoted Lieutenant General, was assigned by Louis XVI in 1780 to command the expedition to aid the American insurgent. In a most unusual gesture, the king directed that Rochambeau was to place himself subordinate to Washington and that the French troops were designated auxiliary to the American land force. Early in their collaboration, it was evident that Rochambeau would work well with Washington and he became his most trusted advisor. He maintained his troops in a very strict discipline manner, which was praised by Hall. His popularity started immediately upon his arrival to Rhode Island, where he established good relationship with the population. Seldom in military history has a military leader ex exhibited such an exemplary command. In December 1791, he became one of the two last general made Marshal of France by Louis XVI. In 1792, at the age of 67, Rochambeau suffering from the wood he received in battle withdrew to his country estate. He barely escaped the guillotine during the darkest hour of the French Revolution, but a free man again in October 1794, he was to live another 13 years, managing his estate, writing his memoir, and raising his grandchildren as his son Donatia was held prisoner in England. On a rare trip to Paris, he was made Grand Officer of the French Legion of Honor. And on that occasion, Napoleon introduced his military staff as his pupil, to which with graciousness, Rochambeau replied, the pupil have fast surpassed the master. He died in 1807 at the age of 82. He is buried in the neighboring village. On his grave, an inscription written by his wife showed the quality 
that had charmed her more than a half a century before. Les souvenirs qu'il a laissés sont ma seule consolation. Sa tombe m'attend et avant d'y entrer, j'ai voulu graver la mémoire de tant de mérite, de tant de bonté, de tant de vertu en reconnaissance de 50 années de bonheur. That's a wonderful uh, last lines in, in uh, reconnaissance of 50 years of, of happiness. Uh, that goes right along with, I think, with uh, what uh, Napoleon told him in front of his uh, generals that uh, he is the master and, you know, goes right back to his uh, the recognition of making him the last marshal of France because uh, Maréchal de France is not a military rank. At the time, it's it's had been awarded since you know for seven hundred years probably already, and it's it's awarded uh, as a uh, as a recognition of exceptional achievement uh, really rather than another another promotion. So you know, looking at if he looking back at his life, uh, he's received every recognition both from from his king as well as from uh, Napoleon. And at the end, from his, from his widow. I mean, uh, a life wonderful lived. I think. Uh, we have a question, Natalie, for you. If yeah. Uh, did you do anything special today to honor your ancestor at the chateau? No, we did not do anything special today, but. On Saturday, next Saturday, we are going to have a meeting just in front of his grave. Well, think about us being Which, there. And we choose that and the that. first Saturday on. Yes, Pardon? please. And uh, we choose the first Saturday of uh, July, which is usually between the 1st of July and the 4th of July. So we have some kind of meetings or um, about that, that time of the, the year. Mm -hmm. Well, think about us standing there with you when you do this special ceremony. Mm -hmm. We'll be with you in spirit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so now let's go to food and menu. Uh, Dr. Selig has convinced me that there probably would not have been anything special in terms of a feast for General Rochambeau since he was figuring that he was going to a land of Tories, refugees, and evil people. And so he was trying to get ready to enter New York with a military force. So Chef Stabe, what do you think he would have eaten on his birthday if he had had a chance to have something special? Well, first, first of all, you, you, you must remember I spent an awful lot of time with Dr. Selig, understanding everything about uh, Comte de Rochambeau. I am a huge admirer. I'm actually one of the many people who thinks that he has not got enough respect as he deserves to have the respect. Because without him, God knows what would have happened. We may would still eat fish and chips and drink warm beer. But my <laughs> point is, my point was, Dr. Seelig helped me tremendously early on understanding that without Rochambeau, it would have been almost an impossibility at a time for the American, uh, would you say, organization to be able to feed all those people and the 700 mile march all the way from Rhode Island down to Yorktown. It takes a lot of savvy. And you know, the French been at war much longer than obviously General Washington and his staff was at the time. So I learned a lot. I also learned a lot uh, when you march in full gear at high heat, as you well know, uh, you got to feed them early. So there's two, way, two ways to look at it. One is what, what they would have prepared what we call today a quartermaster would have prepared for the troops. And the other thing, what would we have given the officers? Matter of fact, Dr. Selig is the one who made sure that I knew way back when that uh, the flower, the beautiful white flower that later on actually Washington produced at a grist mill down uh, in his estate, 
I came all the way from France because the officer would love uh, nothing but a beautiful baguette to get a made of food. So what would he have eaten? I, I will tell you one thing, and obviously haven't met uh, at, at my restaurant, understanding, matter of fact, I had planned to go filming over there, but uh, COVID and financial pressure didn't allow us. Just for anybody that listens, if you, if you have a chance to go on Amazon Prime season nine, you can watch episode 11 is the episode that I did. I went all the way to Rhode Island. I saw them marching, I understand it. And what I cooked at the time was a cassoulet, a cassoulet de canard. And I know for a fact that the, the Côte de Rochambeau had a really fine taste, the meaning by a fine taste, not overabundant of food, a lot of quality food, small food, a lot of, lot of greens, a lot of vegetables, obviously also beautiful wine and beautiful champagne and uh, uh, back to Brigan, you name it, everything was going to be there. But I would think if he had had a chance to celebrate a birthday meal, it would have been most likely something, believe it or not, healthy by comparison speaking, meaning a lot of greens, a lot of vegetables, a lot of items that would be good, and obviously a good amount of seafood, being that he's traveling in Rhode Island, where you're right next to all the lobsters and the shrimps and the, and, 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 and the oysters. So not quite the same good oysters as we have in, in, in France, the Bellon, but they're okay. So I would say a lot of things that I learned, and remember I had planned to have a second episode. I want to come see the Chateau, the worst way. It just never worked out. So with the first episode, I really want to be the finale to uh, the whole joy town, to the whole sending off, uh, you know, getting, getting the freedom this country deserves. And I will have a tremendous respect from a, as a chef. Uh, I'm no culinary, I'm not a, a military historian, Dr. Zulig is, and it's helped me at many occasions to understand the difficulty as it is for people to go on the march and eating. But the, the other beautiful thing is that I learned, the French came with money. The Americans had IOUs. So the Americans couldn't get the cow off the field and pay for it. The French had the money. So they, they would have had an opportunity to eat better, even for the general public, not just for the, the for Mr. Rochambeau himself, you know? So there is so much you, can explain it is unbelievable and my research had shown me that there was fine food i'm talking about the beautiful the cibe, you know the beautiful stools and uh, beautiful things that would have been served and so i'm sure a cassoulet maybe would have been just something down his alley because there's a lot of geese and goose and ducks around the uh, the, the ocean as you come down from Rhode island all the way down towards towards Yorktown and a good amount of venison. I know venison was priced too, and quail, for sure quail, and of course, pheasant. Uh, some people say the stuffed grouse, which is what Washington's favorite, maybe would have been served, but it's difficult to say. But I will tell you one thing, he had an extraordinary taste for really quality food, not in abundance, but in quality. So I hope that answers mostly. Yes, Chef, thank you very much. Uh, from my research, I would think that everyone would believe dinner was a success if it was not salted out of a barrel. Uh, and I know that Dr. Seelig, you have a sense of that. Uh, would you like to offer your insight? Well, one thing, uh, I, I think, uh, Walter, I did not pay uh, Chef Stipe to uh, embark on this uh, hymn of praise for me. But I think uh, I agree uh, with him, too, uh, that he was simple in his tastes, uh, but he knew what he, what he wanted. He was certainly not, not opposed to any uh, big meal. Uh, like when Ezra Stiles visits him in Newport, for example, he writes in his diary, I dine with Rochambeau in a splendid manner. There were perhaps 30 at the table, and I conversed with the general in Latin, uh, you know, the lingua, Franca, but going back to his, his birthday uh, that we were, uh, I don't think birthday celebrations were such a big event in 18th century France. The big celebrations were uh, the Feast of Saint Louis, for example, 
on the 23rd of August or the feast of uh, John the Baptist, who is the uh, patron saint of the Freemasons, things like that. And advertisements for those kind of events is what you find in the in the newspapers in Newport, uh, Rhode Island, for example. And uh, uh, yeah, he certainly had his uh, his uh, preferences, what he would like to to uh, to eat. But once you're on a when you're on a campaign, uh, you can sometimes you can't be as picky as you would like to be. Uh, uh, there's a letter that I have found of by uh, Jeremiah Wadsworth, who uh, writes to uh, John Lloyd from Danbury, which you know just a couple of miles from Newport, where he where he tells him to send uh, every other creature you have that's fit for the knife to uh, to White Plains. Uh, so you know you eat what you have. Uh, you know, for the soldiers, we have uh, you know rations what they're supposed to be getting on the march. For example, uh, the Rochambeau's orderly book says every soldier for every soldier the ration will be in the future one and a half pounds of bread, one ounce of rice, and one pound of fresh meat uh, rather than salted meat. Uh, and I think there's something that uh, uh, we can't stress enough that. Uh, Compared to Americans and Wonder Bread, uh, bread is so much more important in the French cuisine and the French table than it is uh, than it is over here. You know, wherever French you see French troops marching, uh, it doesn't take long when they start build bread ovens for some, you know, for some for some bread. So, uh, Dr. Seelig, just one other yeah. thing to remember: we now know the word pot au feu. Uh, and pot au feu would have been whatever you get your hands on for, for, for the military, whatever you can get in the pot, it comes to pot au feu. And there's nothing, I, I've done several of them uh, on different uh, campaigns and different shows, because I do a good amount of military shows. Uh, a pot au feu would have been also something that would have been served a lot of the troops and also the officers as well. Yeah, uh, and a lot yeah, of what we, goes into the a lot of what goes into the pots then is the result of some creative foraging, right? It doesn't matter whether it's from a loyalist or from a patriot. When you're hungry, uh, you know you don't you know, you don't, can't be picky and choosy. But, well, but since certainly we are talking food, uh, David Wagner did a painting of a spring in Mawa, New Jersey, from which the chef for Rochambeau was trying to find frogs' legs. Do you think that would have been part of a menu? Uh, it's difficult to, to say if frog legs would, would have been eaten, uh, but, but of course, but uh, you would need a lot of frog legs to feed <laughs> a bunch of people. There's only two, two legs on a frog, you know? Uh, so it wouldn't be, yes. Have I, have I read about frog legs? Yes, uh, but uh, I, I'm not so sure there would have been enough, maybe for a small group of people, yeah. Well, as long as uh, the general got his two, then that probably was good enough. Yeah, well, I need more than two. I mean, you normally want to fork legs, you want to make half a dozen to a dozen at least, you know, and so it's not very petite. It's not, not, not a lot, there's not a lot of eating there, but probably done uh, this time of year, if you would have marched down and you had some fresh tomato on a provincial, eh, <laughs> like we said, why not? But what I was trying to get back is really quick saying, that the, the, the French officers, and this is what I know as research, and not just because I'm playing homage to Dr. Selig, the French officer would try to maintain much of their culture as they came along. Because you must also remember, in the early days, uh, the American cuisine didn't have high standards or by people thinking high standards. And that's why so many of the, our, I cooked in the first five presidents' homes, and I can tell you, they were imitating really good French cuisine as much as they could within time. So the, the cuisine uh, uh, that the, the officers trying to maintain, if, even if you go out I mean, uh, to my Quai de la Verde, I can tell you, I mean, if you just go, go on the ships and you see the kind of menus and the manifests that I have and the kind of things that they, they look forward to it. Uh, it was, there were, I mean, yeah, there were, let's be sorry, it was a rough life and they were still well taken care of. I'm not talking about the enlisted men. I'm talking about the officers. That's very important to, to differentiate. Yeah, just uh, to, just, this, this, 
this will be a good segue since we're at happy hour. What would you serve us tonight once we transition to dinner? What would be your menu? Well, you know, tonight what I would serve is because in honor of the, the in honor of Rochambeau and Washington, I would serve one of Mother Washington's favorite favorite meal, which is veal olive. It's a scallopini of veal that is stuffed with crab meat, and then finished in the oven, finished with a beautiful, beautiful sherry cream sauce, beautiful sherry cream sauce, and served with toast points. But guess what? The toast points are covered in foie gras. And she served that already with a little shaved truffle on there. So it's, it's in my book, and it's a dish that I served when we, when we celebrated uh, Le Rion that came over to, to, to Philadelphia after Yorktown. Uh, some of those dishes would have been, would have, this is kind of a dish that would have appealed to a French nobleman such as the Comte de Rochambeau. He would really appreciate it. It was petite, lots of flavor good things because remember in French cooking we love to use beautiful liqueurs as well wines sherry fortified wines Madeiras etc so yeah this this is what I would have served and maybe I would have served some unique vegetable like fried celery or, or any anything unique or maybe braised romaine that we in this country only eat as a seasonal salad but in Europe we, 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 we braise it so it's, Something like this, this level, I, I would think, with, with, again, a small appetizer, possibly. And, but of course, one thing that you will never forget would be a finished great finale of a dessert, like an oeuf à la neige, we call it floating islands. Something small, but beautiful that enhance your palate. And then the end of all that, maybe a beautiful glass of cognac or a glass of Madeira or even a, a sherry, something like that would make a, 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 a finale. So this, if I had a choice right now, and you guys would be here at my house, I got a big test kitchen upstairs, this is what I would make for you. I would make Mother Washington's veal olive, which by the way, in her time was way ahead of its time to mix veal and crab meat together in one dish. That would have been my thing. Uh, we'll be there in four and a half hours, sir. Uh, no problem at all. I, I, I can knock it out in no time. <laughs> Matter of fact, Mr. Seelig is going to go by soon. He, he, he'll be the test. Yes. Uh, so, Dr. Seelig, uh, we have a question as we transition to talking about Rochambeau again. Uh, how would you think Rochambeau would describe Washington as a person as, and as a commander? Uh, that depends on which, how long they have known each other. At the, at the first encounter, uh, you get the same uh, response that you get from many others, French or Americans, that Washington seems to come across as, as cold, impersonal, hard to get into, uh, uh, to make friends with. Uh, but that doesn't last uh, very long, uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, they uh, establish a, a relationship that's based on respect. Uh, they, uh, they know what the other, what their partner is good at, what position they ha have, why they are in that, in that position. Uh, you know, just like Washington knows that uh, Rochambeau is the, the military professional uh, compared to him in by Yorktown, Washington has won how many battles? Uh, you know, not too many, uh, while, uh, while Rochambeau is very much aware very quickly how uh, skillful, how difficult it is for Washington to uh, both keep his continental army together and, uh, and uh, stay on a good side of, of Congress uh, since, since Washington always places uh, the civilian leadership over the military leadership. And so they very quickly come to a... Uh, to an understanding uh, and each, each of them doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and they are, and they are that, that their friendship really lasts and their cooperation uh, lasts, lasts uh, you know, as long as they're together uh, a lifetime. But could, can, I, can I say something big, Jim? Culinarily yes. speaking, culinarily speaking, Washington is a meat and potato guy. It was actually, it was, Mart, it was Martha Washington that brought some finesse because remember, she was a custis, custis had plenty of means. Therefore, she brought it in 
so therefore, there was a big difference from a culinary point of view. I would say that uh, Rochambeau was light years ahead of Washington when it comes to food and entertaining. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I, I guess they would have shared a love of Madeira. Is that not true? That's true. That's true. But, That's but true. beyond that, the, the complaints that you always get is about the bread. You know, French don't like the cornbread that they're getting. They complain about the vast amounts of meat they're supposed to be eating, you know, two, three pounds a day, and the amounts of, of tea they're supposed to be drinking, particularly up in, in, in Rhode Island. Uh, and that's where you come with, with a, a much more varied cuisine that Walter was talking about. Uh, Bob, there was one thing that was implicit in what you had earlier said about Rochambeau and Washington. I think it's remarkable that King Louis XVI told Rochambeau that you will be a subordinate to General Washington, and they both lived with that relationship. Any other thoughts about that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, Rochambeau is a, is a professional, professional soldier, and if the king gives him an order, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what officers do. Uh, you know, you follow, you, uh, follow orders, and... Uh, and uh, again, uh, this is part of this relationship that these two men have. Washington never challenges uh, uh, Rochambeau's uh, military background and knowledge uh, in discussions. For example, shall we go to Yorktown or shall we attack New York City? Uh, so uh, uh, the fact that that uh, they have a div this division of, of labor, almost you could say, and Washington and and if Rochambeau uh, implicitly uh, seems to have acknowledged that uh, there's a supremacy of of, uh, of politics uh, uh, in the American War of Independence because it's such a different uh, kind of war from what he uh, he was used to in in uh, in Europe. You know, in Europe, if you wanted and needed a wagon, you just took it from a, from a peasant. You couldn't do that over here uh, in the United States. So uh, placing himself under the orders of Washington, I think in a way was also an acknowledgement that this is a different kind of environment, social and societal uh, environment where this war, that this war is taking, taking place. So that if he confines his, himself to, uh, to the military aspects, that's really what he should be doing. And he doesn't, he never really challenges Washington's uh, supremacy uh, at all, uh, as when it comes to, to decisions, where to go, what to do. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Naval War College. And so the other complicating factor in all this is Yorktown very much depended upon de Grasse's fleet showing up. <laughs> And so that's just another wrinkle in the generalship of Washington and Rochambeau to be able to work with de Grasse to uh, keep the, uh, the British Royal Navy away and allow the siege to take place at Yorktown. So it seems to yeah. me that if we transition to Yorktown uh, first, Dr. Selig, was that the crowning achievement of Rochambeau's career? Uh, I would say it was the crowning achievement of uh, Rochambeau's uh, career because on this one portrait that we have of Rochambeau, uh, he points, there's a map here. Uh, thanks for putting that slide up. There's a map where you can clearly see uh, 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 writing Yorktown written on there. Uh, but real back uh, just quickly to what you said about the cooperation with, uh, with uh, De Grasse, uh, that was the one thing uh, Rochambeau was not to tell Washington that the grass will be will be uh, coming to the North American coast in July or August of 1781. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Rochambeau told Chatelieu, and Chatelieu, you know, went right to Washington and and told him uh, about it. Chatelieu apparently could not uh, uh, was somewhat of an, an intrigant uh, with intrigues. Anyway, uh, but I think yes. Uh, uh, Rochambeau would have considered and did consider when we look at this portrait uh, 
uh, Yorktown the crowning achievement of his, of his military career because he had an independent command for the first time rather than just being colonel of a, of a uh, regiment. I have a question here that we will maybe see what your take is on that if anybody else would like to comment. Um, what was the relationship between Rochambeau and Lafayette? Uh, somewhat strained, I would say, because we know that Lafayette had, uh, had lobbied for the command that Rochambeau then eventually got, and the king made this very smart choice not to give it to a, you know, 27, 28 year old uh, uh, member of the, of the aristocracy. Once uh, they were in Newport in the fall of 1780, Lafayette kept writing letters trying to get Washington to, uh, and Rochambeau to start a campaign in 1780 still, until you reach a point where Rochambeau then sends a letter to Lafayette and tells him, uh, you know, from an old man to, uh, to a younger man, I know what I'm doing, don't, you know, don't push me, uh, take some advice. And, and he seems to have conveyed this to Washington as well, because it doesn't take very long. And, uh, and Washington sends Lafayette to Virginia out of the way. And so they are, they are uh, separate. Uh, uh, Lafayette is what, 20 years, 30 years younger and is much more impulsive. Let's get do something and all that. And, and Rochambeau uh, with his experience says, yeah, we can, we can start the campaign when we are ready because we probably only have one shot. And, and Washington was aware of that as well. Uh, so uh, they get along, but having one in Newport and the other down in, in Virginia helps as well. Thank you. So Nicole, one of your crowning achievements was the French Yorktown Memorial. Uh, any perspective you'd like to offer us about it? Well, I think the idea came because in France, as you know, we have what is called the Monument aux Morts, in every town, in every city, in every village where uh, there is uh, the name of uh, the people uh, the, of, of the fighter during war who died during the battle. And so the idea came to do the same thing in Yorktown. Uh, I think that the Rochambeau would have been very pleased because he cared very much for uh, his army and he cared very much for uh, his men. Um, I don't think it was, I mean, it, it was not the way things were done at the time, but uh, we felt that uh, we could just uh, go ahead and do it. And it was very well received. And um, it, I, I think that a lot of people, a lot of visitors, a lot of tourists enjoyed just looking at it. It kind of brought the fact that those men crossed the Atlantic, came in the foreign land, did not, uh, did not uh, understand the language. And obviously, as today is showing us, I don't think they either um, enjoyed the heat and the humidity during their march down. So I think that uh, they deserve that memorial. Nicole, can I just say I stood in front of this between this memorial and surrender field. It's a surreal uh, experience. Yes. Well, it, we could it, not put it, it on surrender field. Uh, and the reason we put it there, sir, is because it faced on one side, it faced uh, the battlefield. On the other side, it faced the York River. Yeah. So on one side, it is the army. On the other side, it is uh, the Navy commanded by De Grasse. Oh, but it's absolutely spectacular. I'll and there was, that. and there was a regiment there. The, uh, Le Regiment Touraine was uh -huh. there. So uh -huh. the French were there. So we thought it was, it, it, it just brought all the element to, to have it set uh, on That's that true. land, on that piece of land. Beautiful, merci beautiful. Uh, Natalie, uh, since you're looking at this slide, I hope before you, did you, do you have any reaction to this memorial? 
uh, frozen. Okay, we'll see if we can. Hear well, all I can tell you is that his father, her father's and mother saw the memorial, and they they enjoyed it very much. And uh, Natalie had seen it many times on her visit here to Virginia. Yes, it looks like her uh, transmission is frozen. Thank you very much, Nicole, for adding her perspective. Uh, Johnny, so we're honoring General Rochambeau tonight. You are the trail administrator for the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historic Trail. Uh, how do you think Rochambeau fits into all of this? I'm sorry, Colonel, can you repeat that question again? I had to exit out real quick because of the music. Sorry. I, I wonder, sorry. since we have a trail now and we're celebrating Rochambeau's birthday, do you have any thoughts about how the two of these would fit together? What, what do you think Rochambeau would have thought about the fact that we're honoring the route of his army to Yorktown? Oh, I, I, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think of the direction that the trail has taken over the past few years, especially with the contributions of W3R, the members, uh, the, uh, other organizations such as Friends of Lafayette, the Souvenir de Francais, and countless others that have uh, just really helped to amplify this trail and the contributions of uh, General Rochambeau, General Washington, the lesser known stories of the American Revolution. I really think it, it, it's just, you know, we're just, I feel like uh, the trail's been around since, uh, since I, I know W3R had been working on this since early 2000. And, uh, and look at where we are now, we're uh, 2021. And we're really just starting to get a name out there to help help amplify the contributions that this general and the other French generals played with, with helping to secure our nation's defense. I know personally speaking, uh, growing up, I was unaware of France's contributions, you know, always thought of the American cause and was totally uh, blind to the concept of how much the Franco-American relationship played into securing our freedom. So it's been an educational lesson for me. And, and it's I know that I want to take what I'm learning and help to further share that. So so I look at where we are now today. We're, we're working on uh, signing the trail so where people can understand it better. We're working on a trail app so where people can, visitors can better understand uh, the roles that the French and Americans played. And I'm just really passionate about this. I'm really excited about it because there's just so many great things. So so if I were uh, General Rochambeau, I, I, you know, I would be really uh, pleased and, and, and honored by, by the way my memory would be uh, being uh, recognized and remembered. And that's really just, uh, just really want to thank all of our partners for all your contributions. There's so much I can say about it. It's just so exciting as to the direction that we're going. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I just think it's really great. And I, I think you would be really honored with where, how we're remembering. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, there is one question here. This is the last little section where we're going to maybe wrap up. So the question is, maybe Bob, uh, others may have a perspective on this. Dr. Seeley, would you please talk about the long desired but never realized attack on New York and Rochambeau's perspective and interactions with Washington? We don't have time for a very long thing, but maybe a couple of sentences about the frustration that Washington felt that he could not lead an attack on New York. Now, we know that Washington, uh, for personal reasons, having been thrown out of New York City, as well as political reasons, would have preferred to attack New York City, the center of British military political power and during the War of Independence, etc. Uh, but Washington was also painfully aware of the fact that he needed a fleet to block off the harbor, as well as French uh, contributions and support on land. And he was very much aware of the fact that that he couldn't, he did not have the troops nor the fleet to, uh, to do that. And so when uh, when uh, the letter comes by de Grasse saying that he is sailing to the Chesapeake uh, on the 14th of August to New York City, he really doesn't have a choice. It takes a, it takes a long uh, meeting between those three or four men until Washington realizes he has to do 
where he has to go where the grass uh, is going. Uh, but it was probably uh, the most difficult uh, decision he had to make during his whole military career. Because if the campaign of 1781 doesn't bring any results, then his continental army is going to fall apart and the war is lost. While if the, com the campaign of 1781 doesn't provide any results, uh, as far as Rochambeau is concerned, well, then he'll, they get on board of French vessels, they sail back to France, and you now all's well for them. Uh, there must, maybe there was some tensions there, but, but you know, Washington didn't push. He realized that he doesn't have a choice. And so they marched to your town. So, Nicole, a perspective on this question. Uh, how do you think the French react to remembering Rochambeau's contribution to what happened in America? Well, I... I, I think at the time, uh, the French were preparing for uh, their own revolution. So um, I don't think that uh, the name of Rochambeau or what he achieved in America was uh, as celebrated as it should have been. Nevertheless, um, I think that in his own area and Again, Napoleon recognized him, and when he was at uh, in jail during the revolution, um, they knew who he was. And there is a story that Natalie's father used to tell me that uh, he escaped the guillotine because one of his soldiers recognized him and called him the old marshal. Come on, the old marshal, this is not your day today to go to the guillotine. So there is, a lot of story around how they perceive, but uh, it was not in in the in front of what the entire population was thinking about. Uh, it was very close to the revolution, and there was already movement starting. Thank you. Uh, so, Chef Stay, yeah. we're to our final toast, sir. Any comments about the champagne? that would be a part of such a toast? Well, this is a good one. <laughs> how, how, what, kind, what kind of credit card did you carry? <laughs> we, we can go anywhere from, from, from Tavernshire down to uh, Louis Ritter, you name it. And your question was, how much would we charge our days? In our days, a good glass of champagne costs you anywhere between 20 and $25 in most bistros, as you'll find now. Incidentally, Jim, one other thing. If I saw a bunch of questions coming up. Please tell the people who had the questions. If they email me directly, I'll be very happy to answer them. A culinary, culinary. I stay away from politics. Culinary questions are welcome. So I hope I hope I answered by you saying did, sir. My, my favorite would be Tatoshi, but it doesn't have to be. There are many, many, many beautiful champagne produced outside of champagne. Like in Bordeaux, Bordeaux, not a problem. As long as as long as there's some spiker in there, how is that to celebrate the, the birthday? Well, so, so let's put that into action then. If everyone will charge their glasses, we will then have a final toast. So I'd like to propose a toast to France and the United States of America on the occasions of their national holidays. Vive la France! Huzzah for the United States of America. Three cheers. Hip, hip, huzzah. Uh, hip, hip, huzzah. Uh, hip, hip, huzzah. Uh, fantastic panel. Thank you. Well, Larry, I think we have done our work. I hereby pass it back to you, Mr. Chairman. You're on mute, Larry. As we come to the end of our program, I would just say what a superb job this group of panelists did. Um, and the knowledge that they possess and the uh, interaction is, uh, has been wonderful. I'm sure that each and every one of you that have had the opportunity 
to enjoy the program will say this has truly been an outstanding program. So we thank all of you. But this is just one of many activities that we are doing right now for the 240th anniversary. And um, uh, we hope to bring to you other just as equally uh, fine programs uh, th through this year. So um, we have partnered with the National Park Service, Johnny Carawan. Uh, many of the programs that you see on this list are initiatives by them and W3R has, the, uh, has worked with him to make these programs a success. I, I'm not gonna go through each and every one of them, but one that is probably the most complicated is the bike and kayak tour, which is for the most part gonna follow this trail. And there will be events uh, in every state up and down the trail. And if you will go to the website, you will be able to follow it and maybe participate at a local level. Uh, so uh, please go to our website, and w, Waro website and look for these events and what's taking place. I'm not going to take the time to go through each and every one of them. Um, but I would also say to you, uh, tonight you might've been a viewer, but you can also become a team player and part of the group that is actually making this history available to America. So I would invite you to consider joining or maybe making a donation um, to uh, participate in this extraordinary program to honor Rochambeau and also uh, Washington and others that contributed to our history. With that, the encore. Time for on Larry, time for an encore, sir. This is General George Washington. Your service to this country and to the cause of freedom will not be forgotten. Happy birthday, sir. Bonjour, mon général Rochambeau. This is Lafayette wishing you a very happy birthday. Bon général, this is your third in command, Major General Chastelou, wishing you a happy birthday. This is Admiral DeGrasse wishing you a very happy birthday. This is the Duke Nicholas Zahn, your partner in the American Revolution, wishing you a happy birthday. Jean-Baptiste, c'est votre femme. Jean-Thérèse Terre d'Acosta de Rochambeau. Je vous aime et je vous souhaite un joyeux anniversaire. Merci to all of my friends on my birthday. Au revoir. Good night, everyone.